Welcome once again to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. Now let's move to Off the Press and look at the stories making headlines across Nigeria today. I'm starting with the Punch newspapers and we'll be introducing our guest right after this. It's uh, going to be on the screen in just a few seconds. Yes, it says federal government revokes 5,793 mining licenses in six years. Operators blame insecurity. Revoked licenses not used. Operators failed to start mining, says ministry official. And also miners shone in mining sites because of kidnappers and insurgents, says the association. Fear spreads in southeast as hoodlums murder Akunili's husband and eight others. Nigerians without NIN won't get passports or driving license, says the NCC. And also declared bandits terrorists launch total war against them, Senate tells Buhari. We can also find here, I'm surprised some people oppose electronic voting, says uh, former President Goodluck Jonathan. And this says also, Southern governors should have consulted Northern counterparts on 2023. That's from the governor of Kaduna State, El Rufai. Federal government approves 14-day paternity leave, adopted ch uh, children's fathers covered. And also Buhari orders ex-FIIROD's trial for collecting 18-year salaries with phantom certificate. Another bombing error kills 20 residents in Borno. And also this morning, again, bandits hit Niger, killed 30. Kaduna shots phone services. Those are the ones on the punch newspapers this morning. On the Daily Trust, Senate to Buhari declare bandits as terrorists. Bomb all their locations. On the Daily Trust, XDG says that decision to declare bandits as terrorists is long overdue. Policemen missing as bandits abduct 27 in Tokoto community. EU, UK, FBI, others support EFCC strategic plan. Jonathan asked National Assembly to adopt e-transmission of results. Recruitment into security agencies politicized. That's according to Zulum. Outrage over killing of Akunyili's widower, seven others in Anambra. El Rufai to Southern Governors, you can't get presidency by force. Those are the stories we're looking at this morning on the Daily Trust. All right, from the Daily Trust, let's look at the Daily Independent. Senate to Buhari. Declare bandits terrorists, wage total war. Also, bandits attack uh, Niger community, kill 30. FEC OK's 14 day paternity leave for civil servants. Insecurity, Kaduna shuts down telecom services, bans motorcycles. And also, reps say Nigeria in worst economic situation since 1983. Lekki Tollgate, military never fired live bullets at NTAS protesters, says a forensic expert. Southeast under siege, Johanneza cries out, says killings in Anambra Imo and Inugu call for retrospection. Outrageous gunmen killed Chike Akunili and nine others. Court bars EFCC from retrying Oji Uzo Kalu. Those are the stories on the Daily Independent. Lastly, on the leadership newspaper, hours after Senator's damning verdict, bandits kill 30 in Ninja. Lawmakers want them branded terrorists, say military should bomb them wherever they are. Anxiety groups Kaduna residents as government shuts down telecoms networks today. Agulu community mourns as gunmen killed Dr. Akunili. Labor says governors should focus on security, not next election. Court bars EFCC from retrying Oju Zokalu. Independence Day, federal government declares Friday public holiday. Um, uh, also, let's look at uh, this other one on the, the, on the leadership newspaper. Workers to enjoy 14-day paternity leave 2023. El Rufai is saying that the northern governors didn't oppose power shifts. Hmm. Allow a transmission of election results, Jonathan tells National Assembly. Lawan says diaspora voting is our wish. Also, PIA, NNPC completes CAC on cooperation, now limited liability company. PMB replaces NPR board nominee. I think we're looking at those uh, four papers this morning, and we can say hello to our guest, public affairs analyst, Mr. Ezekiel Ngaitok. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Always a pleasure to be in your lovely station. Mm. On the Daily Independent newspaper, on the Daily Trust as well, um, we see the story here uh, where the Senate is asking the president to declare bandits as terrorists and wage total war. 
Um, I don't know why this has been a subject of debate for a long time now. I'm looking at the terminology and the difference between hoodlums, bandits, and terrorists. Do you think they're one and the same? And do you think um, the nomenclature should change from bandits to terrorists? Um, I've said this before on this program, and um, it, um, sometimes you have very hard choices to make in leadership. And one of such choices is if you have an accident and your hand is bleeding, you have a choice either to keep managing the bleeding till you can get it fixed, Another is that the risk of managing that bleeding is that you can bleed to death, but it might be easier for you if you chopped off that hand so that the rest of the body can live. It's an extremely difficult choice to make, but it's something you have to weigh all the options that are before you. To that extent, there is what you call rules of engagement. When you are dealing with bandits, there are certain things you do not do. If not so, you go into the realm of human rights abuse. Okay. Um, let's see if we can try to reconnect with Mr. Ezekiel Lee. I talked there, um, shedding light on the issue um, of the Senate saying, you know, declare bandits as terrorists, bomb all their locations, decision long overdue. Um, oh, sorry, Gay. If you recall, we had a security expert, Mr. Yahoo Zagetsu, a few weeks ago, um, basically explaining the um, difference between the ISWAP, the Boko Haram terrorists, and the bandits. He really tried to make it clear um, for us to see that when you're talking about ISWAP and Boko Haram, these people seem to be like in the highest class of society regarding education, qualification, and their international network. But when you're looking at bandits, they seem to have little to no education, cannot read and write, um, do not even understand the fundamental tenets of Islam, and simply are motivated for money. But that there is a fact that the Boko Haram and Iswap seem to be integrating these bandits into their fold, seeing that they need men to do the groundwork for them. But well, really, still now about, do we qualify them as Boko Haram terrorists well, or think, not? Well, I think, you know, Mr. Ezekiel is back, but I, I would just, you know, say that uh, I personally don't think it matters if they can speak English or they are learned or they are professors. What's important is the Nigerian government's stance on the security of lives and property of the Nigerian and the value of life of Nigerians. It doesn't matter who they are or how well-trained they are or how smart they are. Um, it, it shouldn't reduce the, you know, the, um, the jail severity time. severity of whatever of the punishment offenses. they get yeah, so, for certain crimes. Yeah, yes. but we're, we're, we're going to be having Yao Zagetso uh, this morning, luckily, so we might get back into that. Mr. Ayayat, welcome back. Yes, thank you. I don't know where you got me lost, but um, I was trying to say that with bandits, um, you have what you call um, rules of engagement. There are certain things you can't engage them by if they are bandits, but when they are terrorists there is an international so with bandits you can't engage them in a certain way but terrorists you can engage them you can actually get in and really really bomb them out that's very important like i gave uh, the analogy before now if you have your hand um, cut in a certain way and really bleeding you can choose to you know manage the hand and hope they can do it well but they will tell you that you are better off cutting that hand so they can stop the bleeding immediately. That's the same thing, the choice that we have to make, a very hard decision concerning these bandits uh, that should be called terrorists. When they are called terrorists, you may need to uh, flush out, you know, wherever they are. They, they're going to be collateral damages, but you are allowed within certain rules of engagement to engage terrorists that way. So I think it's more than long overdue that these people should be designated terrorists so that they can be engaged properly and our army are careful to walk, you know, the lines. So when you, have, you give them that designation, they now have the full right authority to engage them as, as a war, because we're actually in a war. So that's, that to me, I think Yeto, is a very good call. One yes. question I want to ask really is, does the name matter? Yes, it does. No, it does. I'm asking because you, we call someone a Boko Haram terrorist. They kill people, yeah. they rape women, yeah. they kidnap yeah. children. Yeah. You call yeah. someone a bandit and they do yeah. and commit all three crimes. So... Should it matter what their name is? Should we not just it, put out the full weight of the law for all their crimes? No, it matters. You can't put out the full weight of the law on a bandit who is just like a criminal. A, 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 an hmm. armed robber is a criminal. You can't say because 
armed robbers are raiding a certain place, you go and bomb the place. You no, can't we're not talking about, about bombing it. now. Mr. Yetok, what I'm trying no, to no, say no, is no. this. I'm talking of the no, rules of engagement. Mr. Yetok, I'm coming. Wait, what I'm wait, saying wait, is... Wait, wait, wait. Wait, the designation allows certain rules of engagement. That's where, what the point I'm trying to make. If you call them bandits, you can't engage them in a certain way. But if they are designated terrorists, you can engage them, you know, as in a war situation. So that okay. designation is extremely important okay. because it allows our army to decide how to engage them. Okay, so away from engagement, right? If an arm robber commits crimes such as killing a man, raping a woman, and a bandit does the same, and a Boko Haram does the same, and they're all arrested. Are you saying the punishment for these crimes should be different? Because, oh, no, you're an Amraba, you're a kidnapper, you're this. Should the, cri should the punishment for these crimes be different because of their different brands? No. The point is how do, the, the engagement is the most important aspect. Not prosecution we, for we the crimes. Yes, yeah, it's not the prosecution. Right now is how you engage them. The military, our military, are careful to walk the lines of international conventions. There are certain things they cannot do, okay? But in a war situation, you are allowed to, to engage them differently. And right now, what we need is not how to treat them when they are caught. It's how to engage them, to exterminate them. It's now no longer managing them. It is now, it's going to be a war situation. And that can only be done against terrorists and not okay. criminals, okay. so to speak. That, that, that difference is made. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm guessing, well, I, I think I understand, get the point he's trying to make. Uh, you're also not going to send uh, the a military against bandits. Uh, you would expect that there is state security, um, the, the police, police, the NSCDC and the likes who should be able to handle banditry. But I think the challenge we've also and had, the police. Um, I think the challenge we've That's also right. had is really also being able to properly identify the pers persons responsible for these uh, tr uh, crimes against the Nigerian state. Um, at some point, I also felt like people really just called them bandits to reduce the severity of their crimes. Um, you know, reduce the attention that their crimes were getting, whereas they were committing the same things that the Boko Haram were committing. But let's move away from there and also talk about things that are, um, they are also, you know, affecting. Um, it says the federal government revokes 5,793 mining licenses in six years. The operators are blaming insecurity as the reason they are not being able to uh, utilize these uh, licenses. I'm sure we've spoken over time about how much we can also generate from mining um, Nigeria's mineral resources, which doesn't seem to be, you know, be generating much. Um, so, Mr. Ayato, quickly share your thoughts on uh, the revoking of uh, these licenses. You know, you know that 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 um, that headline is very instructive. You mean we have as much as five thousand seven hundred, almost six thousand licenses for mining, and yet this does not is not captured in our national budget, and yet that is supposed to be what is exclusive to the federal government. You know, we run a country where people really take things for granted. The other day, we saw a state government coming to sell gold to Central Bank. So the point is, if the federal government has this number of licenses that are unoperational, they are not even telling us the ones that are operational. The question is, please, which part of the budget have we been able to capture these resources, like the oil that we deal with? I need to know all... Uh, Ms. Ayanito, we might have to reconnect with you maybe via phone. Um, it's been a struggle getting a clear feedback from you um, to get your thoughts really about those mining licenses. Um, I want us to get back to the security conversation. And we're seeing this on the Daily Trust newspaper. Still something we've repeatedly talked about as much as whether um, bandits should be branded as terrorists. And it's about the politicization of recruitment you know, of you know, nationals into security agencies. This is a statement uh, by Governor Zulum. He says that um, it's been highly politicized the way people get into security agencies in Nigeria, and that really this has been left in the hands of job seekers, people who are simply unemployed. We've talked about this many, many times. And um, Mr. Yeto, we'll have you back. Um, let's have you finish up on your on your thoughts regarding the mining licenses. Hopefully, um, we don't lose you this yeah, time. Yeah, what I was saying is that if we have almost 6,000 licenses, non-operational, that they want to revoke, how many are operational? And please, which section of the budget captures that natural resource as that of the oil? 
Because it seems like this, even the banditry we are looking at in the north, it seems to be a ploy because while this is going on, some people have learned how to operate within the system. So a lot of business is going on in that place. People talk about seeing some white men, they are still there. It seems that they've learned how to operate. But my main concern is how is it that these are not, these are natural resources like oil that we fight over. The other day we saw a, a governor coming to sell gold to central bank. Why is this not captured in our national budget? Do we now have two parameters of uh, dealing with our natural resources? It's a question we must interrogate. Hmm. And still about, you know, the question I was, I was going to, um, there's a story on the Daily Trust that says Bono State Governor Baba Ganazunum is alleging that the recruitment into security agencies have been politicized and that it simply gets into the hands of job seekers and the unemployed. And that uh, those enlisted 20 years ago into security agencies are performing well because they entered for the right reasons. They have passion for the country, passion to serve. They received the right training. There was commitment and dedication. And that what you see today in 2021 is a far cry from you know, what we had before. Do you agree that this is true? Because he really went on to talk about slots and how people just um, plug in their own people. Extremely so, he couldn't be more correct. That's the honest truth and the fact of the matter. Every profession has certain things. You know, when I was in secondary school, I happened to have attended a school where you have guardian counseling officers who would come and tell you about the different professions. So you got into nursing because you had that human sympathy. Imagine somebody who cannot stand the sight of blood being a doctor, you know? Now, there, there are some people, if you listen abroad, little children say, I want to be a firefighter. I, I want to be a this. I want to be a broadcaster. They've been watching you. Some ladies, uh, young girls have been watching. They have that passion they build over time. So when they get into the profession, they get into the profession with that passion, you know? So it's not about money. It's not about fame. Some things are just about, you know, that, that what my friend calls psychic satisfaction. That drives them, and that drive brings about excellence. It brings about extra commitment. It brings about the sort of results in the sector. Some people want to be in the army because they understand what it is. But today, why do people want to be in the custom? Why do they want to be in the police also who can stand on the road and collect money? They look at professions have become you know, monetized and not the essence. The essence has become distorted, has been warped, has become blurred, has become almost irrelevant. As a result, we're starting to have people in professions who were not there for the essence of the profession, you know? Now, in terms of security, you must have passion and patriotism, love for country, love for state. You want to make sure that peace is maintained. You want to be an upright person yourself. People need to profile you what your life has been like. But today, as soon as one of my friends got a very big appointment, and when I was telling him about somebody who could help me, he said, my guy, you know, when you come in there, there's a slot they give you, his slot that he had already given the letters, the people have not been able to start to work. And, and so it's actually slot business. It's actually slot business. One of my friends, again, in another very big company, says that, my guy, they have not stopped employing you, but every day new people are coming in. Every day new people are coming in. Mm -hmm. And yet there's not supposed to be. So Nigeria employment, the government is about who you know. It's not about merit. It has absolutely nothing to do with merit. And with that, how can we have a system that works? Imagine me wanting to employ architects in my, in my, in my firm, and then you send me names. No, 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 I'm not going to take. I'm going to interview you and find out what you know, which areas that you work with, you know, and, and I'm not going to have an, a, an architect who work as an electrical engineer or an electrical engineer work as a quantity server. It's not going to work. You're going to have to be in the right place with the right competencies and capacities. That's why I have a wrong company that runs because the right people are doing the right jobs. Hmm. But in government today, all you need is no senator, no this, no that. And it's wrong. We need to stop that. All right. Uh, let's move over, well, sadly, back to security discussions and uh, go to the Southeast where Oaneze, um says uh, that the Southeast is under siege. And of course, I would like you to speak on the death of Dr. Chike Akunyili. Um, which, of course, um, broke yesterday. Yes. Um, I, uh, first, my heart goes out to um, the man. Many people have died, but I can tell you that the man had a wife that was loved by Nigeria and loved on account of her 
passion for this country, on account of which she took great risks. And these people have not forgiven her till today for the things she did. And I do not know if Nigeria as a nation has really, you know, been able to honor her enough to inspire others to know that when you lay down your life for this country, this country will remember you. I hope she does not become a metaphor for a country that does not appreciate. And people say, oh boy, relax. So remember our queen lady, now so she died, now so she just go. Do you understand? So if to make a statement that, yes, you have been killed as they've killed so many people, but you are not just one people, one person they killed, you are the husband of a woman that this country holds dear. And for her sake, we want to leave no stone unturned to make sure that we get to the root of the matter. Just to inspire Nigerians to know that animation that, look, you give your life for this country, this country will go all out in your defense. So for me, within that context, I, I, I mourn his loss, but I think that it's a great opportunity for Nigerians to make a state, to use a sledgehammer to kill a fly, to say that woman never again, no more. So what, what do you have to say really about the fact that it seems that, you know, we're getting statement that the Southeast is under siege and that the IPOB have said that his death was orchestrated by people who poisoned his wife and it has to do with the Anambra state elections. You see, all those things, for me, um, they are in the realms of conjecture. Whatever is the reason, let the police get in. Get the work done. Let them do it with a certain intent of animating the fact that this woman gave her life for this country. And on account of her, several lives were saved because fake drugs, I don't know if we forget so soon, they say the memory of man is treacherous. Fake drugs was killing this country, ravaging this country, almost worse than Boko Haram and the rest, because you have, you know, um, um, antibiotics, you know, you want to take, not knowing that you're taking powder. And imagine you get worse. So it was terrible. It was like you buying death with your own money. But she fought it with her life, and she literally fought it with her life. So for me, she is one woman that this country should use a sledgehammer to kill a fly just to make a statement that she did not die in vain. And I hope we'll have something to say about this electronic transmission of results before we leave. Yes, exactly where we're going. To be honest, um, former uh, President Jonathan is telling the National Assembly, we, we see that on a leadership newspaper, that they should allow a transmission of results. And uh, I think also on another paper, the way it puts is that he's asking them to adopt it and that he would not understand um, you know, the opposition to e-transmission of results. Do you think Jonathan might have any leverage, you know, to influence the National Assembly, you know, to make them agree for the e-transmission of results, electronic voting, and all of that? Former President Jonathan is the most authentic voice to make that statement because he was one Nigerian that was willing to take the risk and he paid, like, uh, my sister Dora Quinley that I just said, he paid dearly for it and he has no regrets whatsoever because he believes that the greater good of this country is higher than his personal gain. And that is a statement that is very rare. So for him to lend his voice, he is, in my mind, the most authentic voice to, to, to be made. The second, which should really be the first, was the beneficiary of that, you know, a electoral, electoral process that is clean. And that's Mr. President. While he was a sacrificial lamb, Mr. President was a beneficiary. And he's not going for a third term. I expect that Mr. President, just like he got out to be the, 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 he would realize that being a minister of petroleum is nothing close to being the champion of credible elections because the country runs based on people they choose and if you write, choose the right people, you have the right country. So electronic transmission of results should be what Mr. President champions and animates. And I'm happy that leaders of conscience, like I've said that, and from what I've seen, Plus TV Africa is one of the people that tomorrow, being the 1st of October, there is a national con uh, you know, a converge on, on electronic transmission of results. And the least I've seen is 
almost unbelievable. And I think it's going to run on several stations. I believe that um, Plus TV will be there directly or indirectly. So this it, a time has come. I think um, President, former President Jonathan has shot the first salvo, but by tomorrow, the, it, the list is almost, if you check the social media, I'm sure it's going to go viral everywhere. They've decided to come and say, this is not about INEX saying we want. This is about Nigeria saying we want. Nigerians across party lines, across ethnic lines, everybody is coming to make a national statement tomorrow on our national televisions and media that we want electronic transmission of results and that the National Assembly should not see this as a call from a certain quarter, but a call from Nigeria. And I think the worst thing they can do is to ignore if Nigerians form a consensus on an issue. Mm. All right. And, um, well, once again, back to talking uh, security challenges. Um, and of course, uh, seeming like knee-jerk reactions uh, to the insecurity challenges. In Kaduna State, it's reported that the government has shut down telecom services and banned motorcycles. It's also reported in Niger State that 30 lives were lost uh, yesterday uh, to, of course, uh, once again, uh, banditry um, in the community. So quickly share your thoughts um, on yeah. these numbers. Dozens and dozens and dozens of Nigerians uh, who would not get to see October 1st. Um, and, of course, the moves by the Kaduna state government uh, to, of course, address these issues. Uh, I am Governor El Rufai is somebody I have a lot of respect for because he is cerebral. But just like every human being, we have a blind spot. I, I, what goes on in southern Kaduna, I do not know why he cannot move his, his, his seat of power to Southern Kaduna and say this must not happen. And there's this all this animation where you say, okay, because it does not happen to your people, Southern Kaduna is predominantly Christians and things like that, and um, he is this and that. I think that leadership means ownership of your constituency. Whatever is your constituency, you forget your tribe, you forget your gender, you forget your party, you become the leader of all the people. So if they are finally taking decisions, hard decisions, because shutting down telecoms is a hard decision. It affects everybody. If there's a price that they have to pay for them to allow people to live in Southern Kaduna and probably the rest of Kaduna generally, I think it's a welcome idea. And like I said, please, we must be willing to make sacrifices and there's going to be collateral damages. But it is better for us to chop off an arm so that we can live than allow that arm to continue to bleed until we die. We have a case that is between the rock and the hard place, and whichever decision that we take has got to have some consequences. Some of them are going to be very, very unpalatable. We will have to lose some innocent people, but these people need to be smoked out, need to be fished out, they need to be, to be, to be exterminated. They need to be exterminated. Okay. Um, we've been talking about this situation where it seems that there's a misfiring, a technical glitch, you know, failure or in coordinates, whatever it is. But what we see and what we've seen over time since as far back as 2017 that I remember is a Nigerian fighter jet opening fire on civilian um, population and then killing them. We've seen um, the one that happened in Iran in um, 2017. We saw the one that happened a few weeks ago in Yobe State. We saw the one that happened um, yesterday. We saw the news yesterday, but it was something that happened on Sunday. And we're seeing another one here on the Punch newspaper that says, um, another bombing error kills 20 residents in Bornu State. Is that seeming to be a pattern here? Because the army released, released a statement saying, oh, that was, a, that was a mistake. We're going to look into it. And then just a few days again, we see another story of a bombing error killing residents in the north. It, it, um, it's something that I've had sleepless nights over. Technology is very straightforward, and it must be handled by the competent. And there are certain technologies that I don't get into because I have not got the competency. If you want to be on a Zoom, there are protocols outside of which you will not get it right. You will not get connectivity. As the world goes really digital and technology advanced, 
do we have the the manpower adequately trained for those protocols? You can keep telling me about technical error. Once in a while, I can understand, but it's been not just one, but so many too many. And I think that the Nigerian army, and you know, when they say, oh, we are looking into it, they are giving us this animation that we are looking into it. It's just a general answer as well. Let's move on. It has happened. It has happened. And it's that eight shouldn't o'clock. Be so. It shouldn't be so. So I think that the Nigerian army should really, really look at the technologies we are deploying, look at the, the, the competencies to that technology, and if they need to hire competencies until they adequately train our people into it, it's just flying an aircraft and plotting the coordinates. It's, you don't need you don't need a, you don't need ten people. You don't need twenty people. You just need an expert, a team. If we need to hire that team in for now, except for a case of sabotage, if there is no sabotage, because you can rule that out, then let us hire the competencies until our people are trained enough. While we are hiring, let's take our own people and give a timeline, maybe six months, maybe one year, so that by the time they come in, they can use like this Tokano jets that they are having. Do we really, while we were waiting for them to come, were we sending people for the training? Are the people that we send for training the ones that are back here? Or are we managing? Don't worry, I'll manage. Some things you don't manage. Some things are so sensitive that they can take a life. And a one life is bad enough for there to be, to be ma major mayhem in a country. America sent the whole of American troops to America, to Nigeria to rescue one life. So we need to be careful and know that human lives matter in this country. Um, well, now that you brought in America, I'm going to you know, continue from there. Um, I shared it, uh, spoke about this yesterday. We're in Afghanistan. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Air Force, um, well, an unmanned aircraft you know, by the, for the U.S. Air Force had, uh, of course, it been error. Um, killed, you know, an Afghanistan uh, man with three of his kids. Uh, they had mistaken his roots that day, you know, for someone who was doing work for ISIS, you know. But of course, when there was investigation, it really was him fetching water from his office and taking it back home. Um, and, you know, there was some communication that was also misunderstood. Uh, there was a full-scale investigation after the Washington Post, um, you know, carried out their on-ground um, work. Uh, the United States uh, president and, of course, uh, a spokesperson, White House spokesperson, you know, spoke, you know, concerning this. Uh, they admitted to error. Um, there's talk about compensation. I don't know if they will go ahead and compensate the families of uh, the Afghanistan, um, you know, a person who was killed, a citizen who was killed. Um, not long ago, also, there was a video clips of um, ha um, Haitian um, immigrants who were trying to cross the border into the United States. The video clips showed um, U.S. border agents on horses, um, you know, using whips or reins uh, for the horses. And, you know, it, it just was a very, very bad um, uh, look for those border agents. United States President Joe Biden and Kamala Harris spoke concerning it. They were questioned. They spoke about it. They also addressed the public. Uh, White House spokesperson also, you know, made, mentioned that there would be investigation and whoever is meant to be punished will be punished to ensure that that never repeats itself. And that's not the way that you treat people who are seeking a better life in the United States. In Nigeria, 150 people were killed, reportedly, in Rand in 2017. In Borno State, in Yobe, um, and I think back again in Borno State, we've heard of, you know, close to, what, 70 or 80 people now who have lost their lives in three different misfires by the Nigerian Air Force. There's not a word from President Muhammad Buhari or the Vice President, Yemir Sibanjo. Um, Ezekiel, yeah, yeah, I talk. I'm sure you know where my question is. Very well, very well. You, you, you see, we really honestly don't know what governance is in this country, if I'm to really put it where it is. We have mistaken politics for governance. Politics is the root, is like the engineer that fixes the aircraft and makes it available. Once the aircraft is ready, the pilot comes to pilot that aircraft, okay? Now, our president, unfortunately, does not seem to understand that he is given a role to play in the larger interest of the people and not that he is rewarded. A political office is not a reward. It's a 
called to service. And I think, I hope I'm wrong, that the president sees himself as a man that Nigerians should be grateful to. to. A, a man that, that, that Nigerians is like an emperor, is like an owner of the estate, that, like the owner of the company. And not the CEO that has a board that he reports to. And that if that board is not doing well, he, he can be fired. Unfortunately, the first board is the National Assembly. And the National Assembly have said, we are his boys. He is our boss. Whatever he says, that we will have. And that does not help, Mr. President, because I said it before and I say it again. This, my mother used to say that, what that simply means that the child that has nothing to fear never amounts to anything in life. You've got to say, what will Nigerians think? What will the National Assembly do? You've got to have that, that, that guardian fear. I use that word, you know, advisedly. And if you don't have it, then you, 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 are, you are not just reckless. You, you do anything, anyhow. Why would so many people be killed so many times? And Mr. President will not address the nation, will not show himself as a father of the nation, will not feel the pains of the people, will not go out of his way to ensure that this can't happen again. This is one too many, and I will do whatever it takes. I use that expression probably with the last time today. I'll use a sledgehammer to kill a fly to let people know that this can't happen. There was a story in the Bible where a king was going to meet his brother somewhere, and then this, the, his, his lieutenants told him that so we have to rush, we have to hurry. And he told them, no, you guys can go. In my camp, I have children and pregnant women. If I overdrive them, I might lose some. Now, that's the heart of a leader. He, 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 what he's going to achieve is not as important as making sure that his people are covered, are comfortable, are fine. Are Nigerians fine? Are Nigerians okay? The greatest chapter in our constitution that I can never quote enough, chapter 2, section 14, subsection 2b says, the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. Is my security, my welfare as a nobody, the primary concern of Mr. President or our governors? I think that Nigerians should wake up to this issue of leadership recruitment and understand what government is. Government is not their estate, it's not their enterprise, it's not their property. It is our, it is, my governor has a private jet, he lives in a 50 billion naira mansion, he has a retinue of eight, we want him so comfortable that he works for us. We're not rewarding him for winning election. No, we are making him very comfortable so he can sit and work for us. There's got to be a reward for that level. Look at our president. He falls ill. We let him go abroad to get treatment. We don't care what it costs us. We don't care that we don't even have the health care. We're saying just get well. Be fine. He has private jets, not one, not two, to the best of my knowledge. We said no problem so that your movements are not hindered. We allow him these things so that he can save us. That's what it is. It's not a reward. It's not a gift. No, we want him to say, you've got to be well. You've got to be comfortable. You've got to be in the best state that is possible. Whatever it needs to give you, give it to you so that you can serve us effectively and efficiently. But they turn around and our welfare no longer matters. Mm. It's not okay. All right. We're looking forward to having more discussions really about the state of our nation, where we're coming from and where we're headed um, tomorrow, being Friday, the public holiday on the 1st of October, marking Nigeria's 61st independent anniversary. Thank you very much for your analysis so far. Public affairs analyst, Mr. Ezekiel Kiyaitok. Have a great day.